Good day and welcome to this week's episode of Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner and owner and founder of Menninger and Associates Financial Planning. Uh, I am joined here by my co-host today, one of my associates, Kyle Ryan. Thank you for joining us, Kyle. Hi, Mike. Thank you for having me. You bet. And uh, Kyle's going to try to keep me in control if that's even possible. <laughs> Um, chime in when, whenever you feel it, that I make a mistake or I'm missing something. And it's always better to hear from two people than it is to hear from one. So um, today's topic is a very interest one, interesting one because uh, I get asked this question a lot. We both do. Um, you know, when you're serving as a financial advisor and as a financial planner, people ask us frequently, hey, you know, should I contribute uh, to the traditional 401k or, or traditional IRA or do I contribute to the Roth? And this question is asked upon us all the time. And like we always say, the answer to almost every financial planning question is what? <laughs> it depends. That's right. It depends. Um, so anyway, so, you know, the six areas of financial planning, this basically picks up two different topics. Uh, you know, they're both retirement planning uh, type of uh, uh, investment instruments. But because of the fact that they have different uh, tax impacts, then it really covers both of them. It's the tax piece of the retirement planning. So what is the difference between a traditional 401k and IRA and a Roth 401k IRA? Well, it all comes down to how they're taxed, okay? And so what we see here is the federal government basically uh, views money in four different buckets. And they also view the money on three time horizons. Now, this is a slide that we've used in our um, tax episodes one and two, uh, basically identifying you know, how the different assets are taxed. So there's only one bucket which gets a tax deduction going in, and that's the 401k, uh, which many people have, uh, 403b, which basically operates the same way, uh, except that it's a nonprofit organization, uh, the IRA and the SEP IRA, which is for business owners, and even pensions. Now, you don't often contribute to your pension, but the company does. And typically, the company's contributing to the pension. What's happening here in this bucket is when you make a contribution to this particular retirement plan, you get a tax deduction. So if you're making $100,000, and you contribute $10,000 to your 401k, well then your W-2 says that you made $90,000. Effectively, that $10,000 is tax deductible. So what happens as you go? Well, as you go, that $10,000 grows to 15, and to 20, to 50, to 100. Are you paying taxes on it along the way? No, okay, it's deferred. But what happens when you take the money out is it's taxed as ordinary income. So if you're in retirement or any time along the way, you take the $10,000 or $20,000 out and it appears on your tax return as income. There's a couple other buckets in the middle we're not gonna talk about today. But you go all the way to the right-hand side and what you have here is the Roth IRA and the Roth 401k. 529 plans from a tax perspective operate the same way, but they're designed for college and cash value insurance is a topic of its own we're not going to discuss today. So what happens here is with the Roth 401k and the Roth IRA, it actually operates in reverse of the traditional. When you make a contribution to your Roth IRA or Roth 401k, you don't get a tax deduction for it. And just like the 401k or the traditional, it grows tax deferred. But when you take it out, it comes out in my two favorite words, tax free. And so the only thing is, is that, and where you see these words deferred, uh, the federal government is offering you a carrot on the stick, but also holding a baseball bat behind his back. And basically says, play by my rules. Yep. And if you don't play by the rules, guess what? You're getting a penalty of how much? 10%. 10%, yep. that's correct. So, so if I contributed and took $10,000 out of my 401k or IRA, my traditional, 
I have to pay, not only do I have to pay income tax on it, but if I'm under the age of 59 and a half, I get spanked with a 10% penalty on it. The Roth works differently, okay? And what happens with the Roth is if I were to take money out of my Roth IRA, I can actually pull my contributions out and not pay taxes on it. But if I grew, like for instance, if I put $6,000 into a Roth IRA and it grew to 10,000, in order for that to be tax-free growth, I must meet two criteria. Those two criteria are, I have to be over 59 and a half and the um, account needs to have been established and funded for at least five years, okay? So, the question then, which is better? And that question is always asked of us, and again, the answer is, it depends. The one basic fundamental reason is, are you going to be in a higher tax bracket today, or are you going to be in a higher tax bracket in retirement? And then the second piece is liquidity needs. And I'll talk about liquidity needs first because the tax piece is a story of its own. So as I referenced, the Roth IRA enables you to contribute after-tax money. And because of the fact that you could take the money out, or at least your contributions, without any tax or penalty, it actually offers a liquidity or accessibility that the traditional IRA and traditional 401k do not offer. For instance, if I put $5,000 a year into my Roth IRA for five years, I put $25,000 in. And let's say it's worth $40,000. Well, I have $15,000 worth of growth. If I wanted to pillage my Roth IRA, I could actually go, go in there and grab the $25,000. No tax, no penalty, no harm, no foul, they say. So that provides liquidity, which actually, oftentimes for younger people, we recommend the Roth IRA if there's any chance that they think they might need the money, it's a great opportunity to be able to have access. And as you know, because you fall under that younger person, you get a lot of years of tax-free growth, don't you? Yep. It's a beautiful yep. thing. And, and compounding growth is, is a magical math thing that really works. So the liquidity is offered because it provides accessibility to the Roth IRA that the traditional IRA does not provide. So let's talk about the tax piece. So the question is, am I going to be in a higher income tax bracket today or am I going to be in a higher income tax bracket in retirement? And the conventional thinking is that people are going to be in a higher income tax bracket in retirement. Heck, you know, I'm 40 years old. You know, our family income is $150,000. Clearly, when I'm in retirement, I'm not working. Yep. So therefore, I must be in a lower income tax bracket in retirement. Yeah. So one would think. <laughs> <laughs> one would think, exactly. Yeah. So not exactly. So if we go back to the history of the tax brackets, what we'd like to show here, it's not really fair to look at the tax brackets from the 60s and the 70s and even the early 80s for two main reasons. Number one, inflation was really out of control in the 70s into the early 80s. So the fact of the matter is, if you were making $100,000 in 1980, that's a whole lot different than making $100,000 today, okay? Furthermore, the tax code was significantly different back then in that you got the ability to take an enormous amount of tax deductions that aren't available today. So let's talk about, call it more recent. Okay, the most recent tax law change, really actually the fundamental major tax law change occurred in 1986. All of the tax law changes that have been since then have been modifications to the 86 tax code. But if you look up at the slide, what you'll see is in the late 80s, there was basically only two income tax brackets. There was 15% and then there was 28%. Well, what happened then is in the early, uh, late 80s, they actually added a new tax bracket to say, hey, wait a minute, 28% isn't really high enough. We want to raise the taxes. So they compressed the 28 down and they threw in the new tax bracket above it of 31% if you made over not much money. Then in the 90s, 
uh, this was under President Clinton, they created more tax brackets. Well, there's our 15. They snuck a 25 in there, okay? And then there's the 28, actually, was it 25? No, it was 28. The 28 was there. And now they compressed all the brackets down again. So the 15, the 25, and the 28 are still there. But now they added a couple more tax brackets of 36 and 39.6 so that they're taxing people higher. But what is really happening is you're reaching the higher tax brackets sooner. So in 2001, President Bush made significant tax cuts. And this was at the time that we were going through a recession. And so what you see that President Bush did is he inserted a 10% tax bracket, also inserted a 25% tax bracket, so that you didn't hit the 28 until a much higher income, and basically reduced the income tax brackets significantly. So I've been teaching taxes and tax planning since 2003, and I've been preaching for 15 years that these are the lowest income tax brackets that we've ever been in, and they can only go in one direction. What happened? Trump made a liar out of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 2018, President Trump made a liar out of me. Uh, he basically cut the taxes like, holy cow. And so what actually happened here is the biggest thing is he reduced the tax brackets, but more importantly, the 24% tax bracket for a married couple went all the way up to almost $330,000 of taxable income, which is half that for a single couple. And if you really look at the history of the tax brackets, we've never seen anything under 28. And here's an opportunity for 24. So why do I think tax brackets are going to go up? They have to go up. And if you watched my episodes on the tax planning one and tax planning two, which I would encourage you to do, there's a whole lot of reasons why the tax brackets we believe are going to go up. We're all familiar with all of the COVID money that the government is spending. Um, the government deficit even prior to COVID, the government was spending four and a half trillion dollars and its revenue is from taxes. It brings in three and a half trillion. So the difference is that it's borrowing the money. Eventually, we got to close the gap and we can't close the gap with trimming costs because those costs can't be trimmed. They've got to raise taxes. As much as I don't like paying taxes and nobody does, I always encourage people to try to find the most tax efficient manner of doing things. No matter how you shake it, the taxes are going up. And we happen to be in the lowest income tax bracket system. And quite frankly, we need to take advantage of it. Okay? So once again, I, I'm here to say that the tax brackets are going to go up. But that doesn't resolve the question of, are my income tax bracket, or my income, is my income tax bracket going to be higher? I think it's pretty clear that the tax brackets will be higher. But when I come back from break, I'm going to explain to you why we believe many people are actually going to be in a higher income tax bracket in retirement when they're not earning money than when they are today when they're earning money. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a few moments as you hear from our commercial sponsors. New Jersey, 130 miles of beautiful beaches, solid rock, and everything in between. In the window. <laughs> now that's New Jersey. 
Plan your New Jersey trip at visitnj.org. Waves of fun. Nights of excitement. And a trail of memories. Now that's New Jersey. Welcome back to Financial Planning Explained, and I'm your host, Mike Menninger, Certified Financial Planner, and I'm here still uh, with Kyle Ryan, one of my associates. Where we left off um, in the first segment, we were talking about uh, why we believe that the tax brackets are going to be higher in retirement than they are today. In fact, uh, I think we can all reasonably project that the tax brackets have to go up and will go up. And if you're not retired already, then guess what? Uh, if they go up, then they're going to go up for you in retirement. So the next question is, is and a lot of people look at me cross-eyed when I tell them, don't be surprised if you actually are in a higher income tax bracket in retirement than you are today. And people are amazed by that. You know, I make $150,000 today. How in the world can I possibly be in a higher income tax bracket in retirement? Well, there's a lot of little reasons that are, are, are tough to believe. So if you, it, I had a, a session, two sessions on tax planning. And what I'd like to do is just review real quick how the tax code works. So what happens is that you get your income and then you get a, your itemized or standard deduction and then you go on to the tax tables. And when you go on to the tax tables, basically, your first $20,000 is taxed at 10%. And then from $20,000 to about $80,000 in today's taxes is 12%. As we discussed, it's likely to go up to 15 if they go back to the old tax brackets. And then you cross over 80 and it's 25 or Right now, it's 22 and it goes up to 25 uh, Good reason to believe that the tax brackets could easily be 15 and 28%. But... Here's what happens is, number one, if anybody has IRAs, hey, you've been contributing to your 401k and your IRA all these years, guess what? It's accumulating. And now that it's accumulating, you're in retirement, you're planning on using these retirement plan assets. So now you use these retirement plan assets and you're going to use your IRAs. You may have pensions. You may have investment accounts. And all of a sudden... They're creating income that is also going to cause your Social Security to become taxable, which we'll discuss in a little bit. But what happens a lot of times is people don't realize, holy cow, you know, now all of a sudden here I am, I'm in retirement, I got my pension, I'm forced to take so, uh, my retirement uh, money at age 72, which is the required minimum distributions. You add that to Social Security, guess what? I'm right back into these tax brackets again. Even if you're in a 15% tax bracket, I'm going to show you later that it's actually not 15, okay? So the other thing that happens is if one spouse dies, generally speaking, the surviving spouse's income does not go down except for the smaller of the two Social Securities. And when that happens, they slide from the married side to the single side. So you only have to hit 40,000 to get into the next tax bracket, which is currently 22, probably 25, maybe 28. So if you've been contributing all these years right now and getting a 22% tax break because you make 150 grand, doesn't that seem counterintuitive? If you're making more than 40 grand in retirement that you're now paying 25 or 28%? So why in the world would you contribute to a deductible IRA and get a 24% tax deduction to only turn around and pay 28 when you take it back out? Yeah. So the other thing is means testing, okay? Now, let's just say Bill Gates probably doesn't need Social Security and probably Jeff Bezos doesn't need it, and there's a lot of Warren Buffett probably doesn't need his Social Security. And where I'm going with that is unless they make major changes to the Social Security rules, the Social Security system is going to run out of money. Now, personally, I don't believe it's going to run out of money. They have to make changes, okay? However, I'm thinking they could means test it. Now, very speculative. They could means test Social Security. What does that mean? Well, Bill Gates doesn't need it. 
So what if they decided to means test it and say, well, gee, if you make over $100,000, you're going to get less Social Security. Well, if that $100,000 is being created by taking money out of your IRA and your 401k and your pension and your Social Security, well, then guess what? They're reducing my Social Security. And if they're reducing my Social Security, it's effectively money going from me to the government as a direct result of my income. That's a tax. Okay, now, would the government means test? <laughs> they already do. Are they? Yeah. What do they means test? Medicare. Medicare. Yeah. So for those people who are over 65 and are paying Medicare, guess what? Once you exceed a certain income threshold, which today is 88000 for single and 176000 for married, but there are people pulling down pensions in giant 401ks that all of a sudden that money's coming out and it's driving their income over that threshold. And now guess what? The federal government has means tested by causing you to pay more for your Medicare because of your income. So if they're already doing it, what's to stop them from doing it with Social Security? I think it's very much within the realm of possibility. But here is probably the most important component, is the taxation of Social Security. I touched upon this on two previous episodes. The one episode, once again, was tax planning, which is a two-part episode, as well as the Social Security, which is a two-part episode, is the taxation of Social Security. I would encourage you to go back and take a look again at that Social Security episode, particularly part two, because I really get into the nuts and bolts of how the Social Security system works. But more importantly is the taxation of Social Security. I'm telling you, a lot of people don't really understand how this works. And when I say a lot of people, I will even admit that there are accountants that I talk to that don't fully understand how it works. So I created this illustration. And what the illustration basically says is the taxation of Social Security is, is Social Security taxable, Kyle? It depends. It depends. How about that? <laughs> Another answer to the same question. It depends. What does it depend on? On your, your other income. Yeah. Okay, so what they do to determine if and how much of your Social Security is taxable is they take all of your other income plus one half of Social Security to determine if and how much of your Social Security is taxable. So in this particular illustration, I used a married couple who has $40,000 in other income. It could be pensions, IRA distributions, income, taxable income, dividends, you name it. Okay, and they have 40,000. And their social security between them is 42. So what they do is they say, okay, we're gonna take the 40,000 plus half of the social security is 21. So that's a total of 61,000. And what they do is they throw you up on these little bracket thingies here. And from zero to 32,000 is zero percent. Is that zero? From 32,000 to 44,000 is at 50 percent. And then from 44,000 to 61,000 is at 85 percent. So what happens here is they now determine this is how much of your Social Security is taxable, okay? So now the question becomes, what happens if I take an extra $1,000 out of my IRA? Well, in this particular example, 40,000 of other income becomes 41. Great. Well, now... That number goes from 61 to 62, which means an extra $850 of Social Security becomes taxable. Well, what is that impact? Well, let's think about this for a minute. If I take $1,000 out of my IRA and I'm in this phase-in range, of which most people are in this phase-in range, what happens here is that they're actually being taxed on $1,850. So in today's tax bracket of 12%, which I think is not going to last, but in today's tax bracket of 12% 12, 12 times 1850 dollars is 22.2%. You may have been making contributions to your 401k and getting a tax deduction at 12% only to turn around and pay 22.2 on the way back out. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? 
What if they raise the tax brackets back to 15%? Okay, 15%. If I take 1,850 times 15%, that's $277.50. $277.50 on $1,000 is 27 and three quarters percent on that thousand. Oh, by the way, you pop into the 25% tax bracket, and I'm telling you, we see this a lot with single people. With single people who have a decent amount of Social Security, their other income launches them into the 25% tax bracket where they're still phasing in on Social Security. So every $1,000 becomes $1,850 at 25% is $462.50. That's a 46 and a quarter percent tax on that $1,000. Oh, by the way, they throw the 28% tax bracket in again? That's 51.8%. And actually was working with a CPA who didn't believe me. I said, hey, tell you what, I want you to try something. I said, I want you to take $1,000 more and add it to her income. And we documented how much tax she had. And we added $1,000 more of an IRA distribution. And I said, so how much did the tax go up by? He goes, holy cow, my goodness, Mike, you're right, 463 bucks. I'm like, that's right. So why in the world would you contribute and get a 22 or a 24% tax deduction only to pay more in the back end? The last reason why is the SECURE Act. The SECURE Act that was implemented that if you die after January 1st of 2020, you now, your IRA, your non-spouse beneficiaries have to take that money out within 10 years. And if they have to take that money out within 10 years, when's the average person die? Life expectancy puts them in their 80s. Well, guess what? The time that you're going to do it, hey, children, I love you, and I love you so much, I'm going to give you my IRA, and I'm going to make you take it out within 10 years, and oh, by the way, I'm going to do it when you're in your highest earning years, in the higher income tax brackets. So I think there's plenty of reasons to say, I think that there's a lot of good reason that the tax brackets are going to be higher, and that many people and I will say a reasonably high percentage of people will actually find themselves in a higher marginal tax bracket. So what do you do? Well, the solution can be, if you have a Roth 401k at work, you may want to flip the switch and start making contributions to the Roth 401k. The other thing that is allowed is you can convert IRA to Roth IRA. It's called a Roth IRA conversion, go figure. What that happens there is you take money from your IRA, you move it to your Roth IRA, and you pay taxes at today's rate. So if I moved $100,000 from my IRA over to the Roth IRA, and I am in a 22% tax bracket, I've got a $22,000 tax bill. Oh, by the way, it's not the happy dance at the household April 15th of the following year. But it is something that I can almost guarantee that people in retirement are going to reflect back and be so thankful that they have the Roth IRA available. Because then when they're taking income in retirement, they take some of their traditional IRA and try to sneak it under the wire and pay the low income tax. And then once the Social Security becomes taxable, now you bring in income from other sources, such as the Roth IRA. So that's today's lesson. The tr traditional 401k IRA versus the Roth 401k IRA. It all comes down to estimating your tax bracket today versus in retirement. We love this stuff. <laughs> and so uh, if you have any questions, we, we encourage you. Uh, uh, please feel free to give us a call. And, and I hope you learned something here. And we encourage you to uh, look at our other episodes of Social Security Planning and Tax Planning. So next week, Kyle is going to be joining me again next week. And we're going to be talking about 
buying the first home, and, and that's really, it's an exciting topic for me. I, every topic's exciting for me, <laughs> but uh, it's because I love what I do. So, uh, and Kyle's thinking about buying his first house, so this is a perfect opportunity for someone in the business who also understands what he's going through, and he's at the age group where his friend's going through it. So, meanwhile, you have a great week. I look forward to seeing you next week, and thanks for all of your participation today. <laughs> so much appreciated. Of course. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.